Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This morning we're going to be in 20 for a brief moment. 21, 22, and camp out in 23. Don't be overwhelmed by that, but I have to set context. Our main passage is actually Exodus 23, verses 20 through 33. But if you want to go to Exodus 20, that will be a good starting point for us this morning. Many of you received one of these Walking with Jesus VBS colorful sheets of paper. These are basically invitations. For those of you who are a part of the Crossroads family, you've been hearing about VBS now for quite some time, but you have friends, you have family members, and so we probably will have some extra ones at the back at the end of the service. Um, if we do and you didn't receive one of these, um, please take one as just an invitation if you have people in your neighborhood that you want to invite. This is just a good reminder of when it's happening and where it's happening and all the pertinent information is there for anybody who doesn't have familiarity with Crossroads. They should be able to figure out from there. But we're looking forward to our time with the children and excited to do some discipleship with them. Some of you are currently walking through some exceptionally challenging seasons. And if you are not currently, you have or you will, right? Because that's, that's how life works. And sometimes we can be walking through such a, a painful season that it can be actually difficult to discern or feel or experience God's presence in our lives. We may intellectually know that God is present because we know that when we give our lives to Christ, that his word tells us that his spirit comes to dwell within us and we can't get any closer to Christ than his presence actually in us. But there are these seasons where we wonder, and this is where books like the book of Job come in, right? With, with intense suffering and big questions about what God may be up to. But it's in those moments that I want us as a church family to be grounded so much in our understanding of scripture and our understanding of who Christ is and where he dwells. That when we start to have those questions, we can go back to the word of God and be reminded of the truth that will set us free, yes, but the truth that will also help to reground us in terms of who God is, who we are in relation to God, and that will continue to give us hope because our God is a God of hope. Last week, we looked at the Ten Commandments, God's ten words to his people, but we looked at it through the lens of idolatry, and I made <laughs> mention of the fact that idolatry is on the front end of the Ten Commandments. Idolatry is on the back end of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And in a sense, idolatry is a thread that runs through all of them. Or I should say the danger of idolatry runs throughout that whole text. And so this morning, we have the opportunity of looking at the end of the book of the covenant. So if you go to Exodus 20, and I hope you're there, you will note that at the beginning of the chapter, God speaks these words to the people of Israel, and then he speaks these words that we know as the Ten Commandments. And the book of the covenant then starts in Exodus chapter 20, verse 22, a new section begins. And that new section goes throughout chapter 21. And if you're there, you can see how the book of the covenant gives very detailed laws about how to treat servants. It gives very detailed laws about injuries. And then in chapter 22, the bold heading in my Bible says protection of property and then social responsibility. Then when you get to Exodus chapter 23, there's specific laws of justice and mercy. Then there are Sabbath laws. Then there are instructions about the three annual feasts in Exodus 23. The Festival of Unleavened Bread, the Festival of the Harvest, which we know as Pentecost. And the Festival of Ingathering. 
And then in verse 20, there's this concluding section. So what I want you to know is that our focus verses for today, verses 20 through 33 of Exodus 23, are like the ending portion of this book of the covenant. It starts with the Ten Commandments, it gets fleshed out in very specific ways, and then it ends with this text. So I'm going to start reading in verse 20 of Exodus 23 and read to the end of the chapter. All of that was by way of context, so we all know exactly what's going on here. So in verse 20, the Lord says, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and run. I will send the hornet, or some translations say hornets, plural, some say plague. And the basic idea is hornets as a plague. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and from the desert to the Euphrates River. I will give into your hands the people who live in the land and you will drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them or with their gods. Do not let them live in your land or they will cause you to sin against me because the worship of their gods will certainly become a snare to you. I want you to note the last verse I just read talks again about idolatry. <clears throat> the worship of their gods will certainly be a snare to you. I had many conversations this past week from some of you post last Sunday's message of idolatry. And when I speak from here, I need you to know that I am in this journey along with you. And as I study and as I pray for messages, I need to be clear that when I stand up here, I'm not speaking down to anybody because I'm in the same boat as you are in terms of on the way of growth in Christ. But it was amazing to me that in my own convictions about my own idolatries that I struggle with in my life, the Holy Spirit is working in your lives as you open up the Word of God and as you surrender to the authority of Christ in your own life. Christ reveals our idols. And as those idols are revealed, as much as that can be a painful process, it's also a liberating process because the truth sets us free and the power of Christ, as we mentioned last week, is more powerful than any power of darkness in this world. And so idols that are confessed are idols that Christ can crush. And this is a daily endeavor for each one of us. Because the moment that we may think that we have an idol that is no longer an issue, 
that idol can rear its ugly head in our hearts. And so the Lord wants us to be vigilant. The Lord wants us to be alert. The devil is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for people to devour. And so we come back again here this morning, ready to be fed by God's word, knowing that we are desperate for the powerful presence of Christ to keep us strong in our faith and to keep us strong to resist the idols and the temptations that we may face around us. And so there's this book of the covenant. And when we read through these sections of scripture, we can be tempted to think, wow, this is law after law after law. This is boring. I want you to listen to what one scholar wrote about this section of scripture, the book of the covenant. This author, this scholar says, God gave the law to help people entrust themselves fully to him, to God, and live all of life under his gracious rule. The law is not just a set of rules to control their behavior. In other words, this law is a gift from the perfect lawgiver to help us understand how God wants us to live in relationship with him. Remember, the people are getting ready to go into the promised land, and God is preparing them for what they will encounter, what they will see in terms of other people's worship, which is why this command to not worship other idols is so prominent in this text. And so one thing to note, too, is that when God called Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, God promised to give him a nation, a people, and he also promised to give him land. And so the people have been growing in their population, first in slavery in Egypt, now in the wilderness. So God has been fulfilling his promise for the people. Now God is ready to fulfill his promise for them to take the land. But God said to Abraham, all those years prior, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here to the place where they are. And then it says this, it's this little phrase that could be easily overlooked. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So the people of Israel are getting ready to go into the promised land. Who's living in the promised land? Among other people, the Amorites. And when God spoke to Abram in Genesis, he said the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Guess what? Now it has. And so there are some challenging passages in the Old Testament about war and God sending his people in to conquer lands and conquer people. But in the context of them going in to conquer the land, it all goes back to the promise given to Abraham that there would come a time when the sins of the Amorites and the other people living in the land had reached their full measure. And God says, enough is enough. And who does he use to enact judgment upon these people groups living in the promised land? It's the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel disobeyed, guess who God used to come in and judge them? People like the Babylonians. People like the Assyrians. So there's a backdrop to military conquest in the Old Testament that we have to keep fresh in our minds. This is a sovereign God working his sovereign plan for all nations, and a lot of the times it involves his judgment, and he allows people the opportunity to repent, but when the sins have reached their full measure, there is accountability, there is judgment, there is a day of reckoning. So all of that is a backdrop to what is happening here. But I want to look now at this particular text and the, the chapters preceding Exodus 23 through this lens of God's presence in our lives. If you are a follower, a lover of Jesus Christ, you need to understand and be reminded this morning that the very presence of Christ dwells within you. But we go through things. We forget that. And we maybe don't feel in an emotional sense sometimes his presence, but his presence is still there. And so the first point I want to make from this broader context this morning is this about God's presence that we can experience, you can experience. I can experience 
God's presence in the daily details, the minutia of daily living, all right? From what you would consider to be the most extravagant part of your day, the most significant part of your day, to what you would consider to be the most mundane part of your day. On your outline, I put a couple of verses from earlier on in Exodus 23, where God gives us these details about how this law is fleshed out in daily living. And by the way, when you read Old Testament law and you sometimes get lost in the details and in the minutia, one of the things that I want you to take note of is this, that God wants your life, every aspect of it, to be seen as an act of worship for him. We can read some texts in the Old Testament like, why is that there? Does God really care about those details? And he actually cares about the smallest thing of our lives to be offered to him as an act of worship. Look what Exodus 23 verse 2 says. Very simply, do not follow the crowd in wrongdoing. I would say that's pertinent to everybody in this room, right? Don't follow the crowd. We say that to young people, so I'll say it again. Young people, don't follow the crowd. But are adults exempt? I don't think so. And so idolatry can be stoked by following the crowd. The crowd that is not walking according to the word of God or the ways of God or the power of God. And so God can be honored in your life this week. And God can be honored in my life by not following the crowd. Sometimes we wonder, how am I supposed to live for the Lord? How does that kind of get fleshed out in my daily life? One of the ways this week for us is don't get sucked downstream by the current of the culture. Swim like a salmon upstream, right? And don't get caught up in the crowd. Then in verse 4, I love this. One of the laws was this. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey, Think about that neighbor you struggle with. And something that they own either blows into your yard with a big storm or whatever. You come across it. Be sure to return it. If you borrow something this week, just give it back. It's a detail of daily life. It's worship. And so... One of my heroes in this regard, and I've mentioned his name many times before, is a man from the 17th century, going back a long time, and his name is Brother Lawrence. And he was a 17th century lay monk who lived in a monastery, and for years upon years upon years upon years, chose to work in the monastery kitchen, mopping floors, cleaning pots and pans. And he wrote this little book, and I have a copy of it in my office, and I've referenced it before, and it's called The Practice of the Presence of God. And Brother Lawrence learned through the discipline of his work in the kitchen to commune with Jesus Christ, to be thankful for the job that God has given him, had given him, to be thankful for the way that God's presence was available to him to be experienced every moment of every day in the kitchen of the monastery. In his book, he wrote, We ought not to be weary of doing little things for the love of God, who regards not the greatness of the work, but the love with which it is performed. We actually have that little saying in our office area of the church. A quote by Brother Lawrence, because sometimes we get caught in that trap of wanting to do great and mighty things. And great and mighty things can be washing dishes for the glory of Christ, mopping floors for the glory of Jesus. Washing your car this week can be done as an act of worship. Our work is ultimately done for the glory of Jesus Christ. We had our quarterly 
pest control at the church done this past week. I love talking to workers when I come. It's very illuminating to me. And the worker that came this past week was a worker who's been coming for quite a while. And he told me he's been working for the company now for two years. And he's one of the longest standing employees of the company at two years. And he said to me that they're always looking for people to hire. They're having a hard time finding people that work for any length of time at all. And lately, there's been a trend of people working two or three days and just not showing up after that, not calling, nothing. So here's a reality for us as followers of Jesus Christ. If a Christian, a lover of Jesus, is doing pest control, and this person who's been there for two years now is a follower of Jesus, if a follower of Jesus is doing pest control, they know that when they're applying chemicals on baseboard, they are not doing that primarily for crossroads or the owner of the home. They're doing it for Christ, ultimately. And so spraying bug spray is an act of worship. Changes everything. It's a game changer. So some of you this past week maybe were frustrated with some of the mundane aspects of your work, and I challenge you, and I challenge myself. I've got some mundane aspects to my work. I have to constantly challenge myself that God cares about every detail, and every detail of our lives is an opportunity to worship. We are to offer our whole being to Christ as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. And so vacuuming the floor can be done with joy. And we have people at this church who vacuum the carpet with joy because of that proper biblical perspective that what they're doing is actually worship. So I want you to see not going along with the crowd is worship. Your neighbor's dog wanders into your yard, return it. Don't try and sell it. Return it, right? <laughs> it's an act of worship for the glory of Christ. Second, there's a comforting truth in this passage. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around this because it's so great. God's presence not only dwells within you, but God's presence actually goes before us. There is this huge theme in this text, and I've notated some of them on your handout. Verse 20, the Lord says, see, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way, which, by the way, if you read this text closely, the angel of the Lord is connected to the Lord himself. It even says in this text that in this angel of the Lord is the name of God, capital N. So many scholars believe that, once again, this is a pre-incarnate revelation of the Son of God coming to the people of Israel as the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord has the name of God in him. The name of God is not just the name, Yahweh, it's actually the character, the very being of God. So think about that for a moment. Think about it for your life. The presence of the living Christ not only in you, but Christ goes before you into situations. Verse 23, my angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, and the other groups. Verse 27, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. Verse 28, I will send the hornet or the hornets or the plague ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. There is this powerful, recurring theme of God going before his people. Some of you may be stressing out about something that you have going on this, let's just say Thursday, right? Because every week is like that. We've got things in our calendars in the days ahead that we have written down. It could be a doctor's appointment, right, for a test. You don't know what's going to be happening with that. 
It could be an appointment with someone else. It could be a, a lunch date with somebody and you're trying to work through some relational issues. This text reminds us that Christ goes before us into all of those situations and actually, in a sense, he's already there, right? Because our eternal God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is not entrapped in our same sense of time. He's beyond our time. And so Christ goes before you into your Thursday meeting. John Wesley was a great theologian. And one of his things that he loved to talk about was the grace of Jesus Christ. But there was one aspect of God's grace that he would often highlight, and it's what theologians have come to, to know as prevenient grace. This grace that goes before us. In other words, even before you surrendered your life to Jesus, God was at work in your life, drawing you to himself. Because we can't even have a relationship with God unless God draws us by his grace into that relationship. So theologians have talked about provenient grace, grace that goes before to, to guide and to lead. And so even before we became Christians, God was working on us, on our situations, wooing us and, and drawing us in. He went before us. I remember when my family moved from Rockford, Illinois, to the Chicago area. It was a very intimidating move because Rockford was a little bit more rural, suburban. Chicago was much more urban. And we moved in the early spring, I believe. And so I wanted to play baseball that summer. And my parents didn't really have a lot of time to find out what the best leagues were. They just kind of connected with a friend who told them you need to play at Amundsen Park, which was not in Oak Park, the city that I was raised in, but just adjacent across the Chicago city line proper was this Amundsen Park. And so I was terrified to go from Rockford to Chicago and then just go to this strange ballpark to meet all of these new players, to go to tryouts, to meet these coaches. It was a very intimidating process. But I remember the first day going, my dad took me and he basically said, this is gonna be okay, we're gonna do this. And he went before me and introduced me to all the coaches. He introduced me to the league official and he got me set up at the tryouts and he was there. And there was something about him not just being willing to go with me, but going before me to pave the way, to kind of smooth out that path, because apart from him going before me, I would have never left the house. I would have been petrified, terrified, filled with anxiety. It was bad enough, hard enough to go with my dad paving the way, let alone going without him. And I'll never forget when we moved to that area too and I started at a new school mid-year and I met with the principal and he kind of laid down the law of the school for me, you know, put the fear of Jesus into me before I actually got to the classroom. <laughs> but then he got up and he said, follow me. And so I followed this principal to the classroom and he was the one who opened the door and introduced me to the teacher and the other students. There's no way. I could have done something like that by myself. There's no way I could have gone through that experience without having someone being willing to stand up, be the authority figure, and pave the way and go before me. God says to the people when they're getting ready to go into the promised land, I'm going to go before you. My presence is not just going to be with you. My presence is going to be in front of you. And so the Lord is going before you this week. No matter where you're going, new school, strange ball field, it doesn't matter. The Lord loves you. He's got you. He's, he's working on you, just like with his prevenient grace and leading you into salvation. Now he's committed to dwelling in you, but continuing to move before you in the different places where he leads you. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were, we're still in this place of sin, Christ loved. He sent his son that going before acts of love. It's interesting that Jesus in John 14 tells his disciples 
Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then Jesus says, my father's house has, has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Isn't it cool to think about this? That Jesus now has gone before us into the heavenlies to prepare a place for you and for me. And then he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. The presence of God goes before us and before the people of Israel as they're moving into the promised land. Jesus ascends into heaven. He's going before us to prepare a place for us. He's getting it ready for you and for me. God's presence goes before us. And then thirdly, I want to draw out from this text another reality of God's presence. And it's simply this, that God works <coughs> through his presence progressively, progressively. I will say that again, progressively in our lives to bring growth. I want you to look at verse 29 again. I've been ruminating on verse 29 and 30 a lot this week. There's a lot here. It says in verse 29, but I will not drive them out, all of these people in the promised land, in a single year. And we hear something like that and we're just like, well, that's a bummer. God could do it instantaneously if he wanted to. And he tells the people, I'm not going to do it in a single year. Why? God's got his plan. And it's an incredibly wise plan. There is no wiser plan than the plan of God. Because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Interesting. Even though the people of Israel had been growing in their population, God in his sovereignty knew that there were still not enough people to go in and take all of the land at once and to be able to cultivate all of the land that had been cultivated by the Amorites and all of those other peoples that were there. Because we have to remember that God is giving this land to these people fully cultivated. The farms are producing. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. There's livestock and there's crops. But if all of the people go in and God gives them all of the land, but they don't have the resources to manage it all, then some of the crops are going to die off. The land is going to become desolate. It's going to be taken over by weeds and wild animals, and it's going to be chaotic. And God is not a God of chaos, he's a God of order, and he wants these people to go in in a systematic way to be able to cultivate the land that they take over. And so, in verse 30, he says, little by little, progressively, not all at once. Little by little I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Now, interestingly enough, the people don't really take over all of the land that God gives them until David is king, and that's only for a short period of time. And so none of these people are going to experience the fullness of the land. They're going to have to do it little by little. I think there's a beautiful connection here with their own lives. If you are a lover and a follower of Jesus, you need to understand that you became a Christian pretty much instantaneously. That new birth happened through the power of the Holy Spirit when you repented of your sins and you turned to Christ. And so you are a new creation in Christ. Paul says to the church in Corinth that the old is gone the new is here, and yet you are not what you someday will be when you see Christ face to face. That new song that we introduced to you this morning talks about meeting our King face to face, when we will be fully glorified in his presence. But between our conversion and seeing Christ face to face, guess how you grow in your walk with Christ? 
Little by little. Little by little. Some people get frustrated that they're not seeing more growth, even though they feel like they are connected to Christ. And I want to encourage you to know that Christ is at work in your life if you are surrendered to him and to his word and seeking to keep in step with the spirit. God is growing. There's the fruit of the spirit. That is how we kind of exhibit that growth. It's that supernaturally produced fruit in us as we abide in Christ. But most often, God works in this little by little way. A couple years ago, we had to replace our whole front yard because our St. Augustine sod bit the dust. If anyone tells you it's easy to have a good lawn in Florida, look them in the face and say, liar. <laughs> you would think so because of the rain, right? But there's so many other things that make it difficult. So we resodded our front yard with a different kind of grass that was supposedly much more easy to have a nice looking lawn with. And so if I see the person who sold me that bill of goods, I'm gonna say, liar. No. <laughs> But the kind of grass we have now goes dormant. And so it gets brown, not quite as beautiful as St. Augustine lawn in the wintertime. And so Christy and I, since we just replaced this a couple years ago, it hasn't been that long, we've been kind of panicking during this kind of winter and then little drought season that we've been having because the lawn doesn't seem to be perking up as quickly as we would like it to perk up. But since we've been getting a little bit more rain, I'm starting to notice that there's this little by little process that's happening. It's getting greener little by little. Some of these kind of barren patches are slowly filling in little <laughs> by little and some of the growth almost seems imperceptible and then I'll wake up and I'll walk out my front door and I'll be like it, it's I think it's happening it's happening and isn't that what it's like with our lives in Christ it's little by little I've never seen someone who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ and the next day they wake up and there's so much fruit of the Spirit hanging off their life they can't even get out of bed. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. We are changed. New creation. Boom. New identity. Yes. And then it's this little by little lifelong process of growth, maturation, allowing Christ to, to water us with his word, Worship, small group, but what do we have to do? We have to put ourselves in a position where we're going to be growing. And you're doing one of those things today <clears throat> by not forsaking the gathering together of believers. This is a portion of your little by little. Tomorrow, when you crack open the word, and even if you only spend 10 minutes in God's word, getting some nutrients for the day. That's a part of your little by little. When you put on a worship song on the way to work tomorrow instead of listening to something that's going to pull you down, that's a part of your little by little. When you connect with someone in a small group or you get together with someone for lunch to talk about Jesus and how they're doing, that's a part of your little by little. And then one day you wake up and you realize Fruit's happening. God's working. The Spirit is doing what the Spirit does. And all we're doing is putting ourselves in a position where we're allowing God to do His thing. When my son played baseball, he had a coach. And his coach said something that has stuck with me. He was like, I want to put players in a position where they're going to have the most likelihood of succeeding. Which means... 
you don't put a player who can't catch a baseball at first base, right? <laughs> because you're setting the poor child up for failure. So you find the spot. It's all about just putting the person in the right spot. The Christian life is about us finding that right spot, which is a surrendered heart, a surrendered life, a Christ-directed life, and then we let Jesus do his thing. And yet, here's the challenge. We live in a culture that celebrates and accentuates instantaneous stuff, which is why discipleship is challenging in an instant culture. A famous pastor, teacher named A.W. Tozer wrote this. He said, instant Christianity fails to understand the true nature of the Christian life, which is not static, but dynamic and expanding. Instant Christianity overlooks the fact that a new Christian is a living organism as certainly as a new baby is, and must have nourishment and exercise to assure normal growth. So when we come to Christ, we are an infant in Jesus. And infants don't wake up on like a Tuesday and they're suddenly an 18-year-old. <laughs> that would be really weird. We would call that a problem, right? And so what is normal growth? Little by little by little by little. You go to the doctor who's a pediatrician with a child, in the growth chart. And what is the growth chart? Little by little. And that's what the Lord wants from today. You, let's pray. Father, we thank you that right now, in this quiet moment, you are working. We may even wonder, what are you doing? Is the Lord working? Yes, you are. And so we thank you for that. We thank you that you are producing in us what we could never produce in us. We actually are looking more like Jesus over time, over our entire lifetime. And so, Lord, we just take this opportunity this morning to say, number one, thank you for your graceful presence in our lives, for choosing to dwell in us. We say thank you for going before us. It's mind-blowing enough to know that you dwell within us. It's double mind-blowing to know that in every situation this week that we will encounter, you arrived first. To know what we'll need when we get there. To know how you want to minister to us when we get there, to give us that calm and peaceful assurance to know that we don't have to worry about what we'll encounter when we get to that meeting or that appointment, because you're already there, and we thank you for that. So Lord, I pray that wherever we are with you, that this next week would be an opportunity for each one of us to put ourselves in a position of growth, in your word, in fellowship with others, loving and serving our neighbor, so that little by little by little, can look more like Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who bore our sin on the cross, bore our shame, so that we could experience forgiveness and freedom. We thank you and we praise you. And it's in the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing the doxology together as we close?